Today, all parties convened in court for the adoption of addresses. Atiku and the PDP took the lead in the morning session, while Peter Obi and the Labor Party started their proceedings at 2 p.m. Let's begin with the morning proceedings, where Atiku's counsel firmly presented his case, leading to a heated exchange with the presiding judge. During the interaction, the judge dropped hints about the possible outcome of one of the grounds for Tanubu's disqualification. We will delve into that shortly. The presiding judge, Honorable Justice Samani, addressed Atiku's counsel with a question regarding the filing of a reply. The judge pointed out that as a petitioner, they were not entitled to file a reply, but rather only a final address on their case. Atiku's counsel defended their actions, explaining that the court had previously allowed them to file the reply on July 5th. However, the judge disagreed, expressing concerns about the multiple final addresses filed by the counsel for different respondents. The judge suggested that Atiku's counsel should have filed a single written address addressing all the respondents. Atiku's counsel argued that since the respondents filed on different days and different issues, they needed to address them separately. The counsel pointed out that each respondent presented their case from different angles, justifying their decision to respond to each separately. Despite the objections, the presiding judge insisted on a unified approach. Justice Balaji intervened, expressing surprise at the filing of three separate replies by the plaintiff in response to the defendant's replies. Atiku's counsel clarified that they deliberately responded to each respondent individually, as they felt it necessary to address the unique arguments made by each party. After some back and forth, the presiding judge allowed Atiku's counsel to retain three of the replies, removing only the letter submitted. The judges were concerned about the sensitivity of the case, given its high profile and significant public interest. They understood that the outcome could generate widespread attention and discussion, especially on social media. While they wanted to uphold the rules and ensure a fair trial, they also sought to manage the workload resulting from the massive evidence submitted by the petitioners. In the end, the court accepted the replies from Atiku's counsel, and the proceedings continued with the case remaining critical and drawing attention from millions of Nigerians eager to know the outcome of the presidential election petition tribunal. It was apparent that the judges were striving to maintain a balanced approach and avoid any unnecessary complications that might arise during the trial. On the respondent side, Tinubu's counsel made impassioned closing remarks, appealing to the court. My lord, citizenship by birth cannot be disqualified. The matter of Guinean passports should not even be considered. Regarding the university certificate, there is no documentary or oral testimony from Chicago State University disclaiming the second respondent's certificate. Therefore, we urge you to dismiss this petition as it lacks jurisdiction and factual basis. He went on to assert that there was no way PDP could win as they failed to present any figures or numbers supporting their claim, and their witnesses could not state their polling unit scores. The counsel suggested an outright dismissal of the case, emphasizing that there is no precedent for presidential election cancellation. Now it was Atiku's counsel's turn to address the court. He responded to his learned colleague's remarks, stating, My lord, my learned colleague argues that criminal offenses are subject to time limitations and the Constitution forgives crimes. However, I must assert that time does not run against crime. The courtroom echoed with agreement, prompting the presiding judge to intervene and urge the counsel not to mislead the public, emphasizing the constitutional provisions for the duration a crime can stand. Undeterred, Atiku's counsel continued, My lord, at least he admitted that the second respondent committed a crime. While there may be forgiveness in the Constitution, we must not forget that there are also punishments for sins. His statement was met with serious clapping and approval from the audience. The judge made a lighthearted remark about Christians forgiving, comparing the counsel to Jesus, which drew laughter from the courtroom. Atiku's counsel pressed on, addressing the issue of the precedent for annuling a presidential election. Tinubu's counsel objected to the use of the word annul, leading to a tense moment. Despite the interruption, Atiku's counsel asserted, that precedent they claim has never happened can be created today and applied in this case. Today, let the precedent be set and heaven will not fall. 
he concluded his address to the courtroom's applause, leaving a powerful impression. The atmosphere in the courtroom was filled with emotion and excitement as Atiku's counsel delivered an impressive performance. The audience was captivated by the compelling arguments and the passion exhibited during the closing remarks. During the adoption of addresses between the respondents and the Labor Party, it became evident that the presiding judge was a no-nonsense individual. Some speculated whether this could be an indication of how he would decide the case. Particularly concerning was the possibility that the judge might dismiss the forfeiture case against Tanubu based on the argument that it had been over 10 years since the alleged incident. This could set a troubling precedent in Nigeria, potentially allowing individuals to commit crimes, wait 10 years, and then contest elections without consequences. Such a policy might not be something to be proud of as a nation. However, it was just one of several disqualification grounds Tanubu was facing at the tribunal. An interesting moment arose when Olani Pekun argued that Chicago State University should provide oral evidence on Tanubu's certificate forgery. Some found this argument laughable, pointing out that previous politicians disqualified by the Supreme Court for certificate forgery did not require their universities to provide oral testimony. They argued that a certificate downloaded from Pinterest had nothing to do with the university, asserting that Tanubu had simply forged it. The authentic certificate was already tendered in court, and the judges would ultimately make a decision. There was no need for any oral testimony from the university, as demanding such could have implications for future forgery cases. Moving on to the adoption of addresses between the respondents and the Labor Party, the proceedings commenced after introductions. Inet counsel designated a colleague to handle the proceedings, stating that objections on document admissibility were filed on July 14, 2023, and a reply on points of law on July 28, 2023. Tanubu's counsel, too, assigned the mic to a junior colleague who informed the court about the response filed on July 23, 2023, after receiving the petitioner's reply and the subsequent filing of points of law on July 27, 2023. APC's counsel followed suit, acknowledging their reply filed on July 23, 2023, and the points of law on July 27, 2023. They urged the judges to reject the petitioner's documents. When it was the Labor Party's turn, their lead counsel handed over to another colleague, who attempted to address the court step by step. The presiding judge disapproved of this approach, instructing them to respond to all respondents at once. After a brief discussion, the counsel complied and another colleague took the mic. They stated that objections were filed against the first respondent on July 14, 2023, and against the second and third respondents on July 20, 2023. The counsel respectfully adopted the arguments in opposition to the documents submitted by all respondents and sought the court's sustenance of their objections. The presiding judge reminded everyone that they would have 10 minutes for adoptions and 20 minutes for their final oral submissions. The INEC counsel took the floor to address the court and sought permission to clarify their written address. They emphasized that the petitioners misunderstood the technology introduced by the respondent, which was used for authentication of voters and results upload. The first respondent went to great lengths to ensure the technology functioned well. The evidence presented by the respondents indicated that electronic collation did not exist and manual collation was carried out impeccably. The petitioners failed to provide evidence to support their claim of a glitch designed for result manipulation. The INEC Council urged the court to dismiss the petition as they believed the glitch did not affect the presidential election and there was no evidence of manipulation. Next. Tinubu's counsel argued that the petitioners had no case and cited the Supreme Court's decision on the double nomination of Shetima as precedent. They referred to Section 137, Subsection 1D of the Constitution, asserting that any offense 10 years after would not be valid. The counsel also argued that FCT should not be treated differently from other states in terms of the 25% requirement. They presented evidence showing the first petitioner's ineligibility for a rerun, as well as evidence that he was not a member of the Labor Party. The APC Council joined in calling for the swift dismissal of the case, 
labeling it an abuse of court time. They asserted that the petitioner's attacks on the results should be done polling unit by polling unit with proper proof. The council highlighted that if a rerun election were to occur, it would be between the winner and the runner-up, not involving the petitioner. The council defended the second respondent's eligibility and referred to the Constitution's provision for 25% in 25 states. They argued that INX scored 90% in the election and requested the petition be thrown out. Throughout the proceedings, the judges maintained control, occasionally intervening to address issues like the time limit and technical glitches. As the arguments were presented, the courtroom atmosphere was charged with tension and anticipation for the final decision of the court. Now, it's the LP counsel's turn to address the court, and they firmly assert that the respondents' efforts to undermine the petition have been in vain. Referring to the case of Oyatola versus INEC, the LP counsel highlights the significance of the IRE of Portal as a crucial part of the electoral process. They draw attention to paragraph 22 of the witness disposition, which the respondents have overlooked. According to the witness, the authentic portal for accessing election results for review or determination is the IREV portal. The LP Council argues that an election with 18,000 blurred results uploaded on the IREV portal is fundamentally flawed. They question the authenticity of the certified true copies, CTCs, of documents provided by INEC asserting that CTCs must be exact replicas of the originals and blurred CTCs imply the originals are blurred. This raises concerns about the basis for declaring the election results if the originals are unreadable. Turning to the issue of the second respondent's forfeiture of $460,000 in proceeds of narcotics, the LP Council accuses the respondents of avoiding the main issue and focusing solely on Section 137 subsection 1d of the constitution they argue that the constitution is clear on crimes like money laundering and narcotics and these should not be ignored regarding the possibility of a rerun election the lp council maintains that only the first petitioner is eligible as stated in section 131 subsection 3d they criticize the second petitioner's lawyer for claiming the petition has been abandoned pointing out the efforts made in filing replies and the absence of witnesses. On the matter of FCT, the LP Council emphasizes that the Constitution's meaning of and must be clarified, and they suggest that the respondents have failed to address this crucial aspect. They contend that the petitioners have successfully proven their case and that the issue of noncompliance by INEC is indefensible. They dismiss the claim that toner issues cause blurred CTCs, considering it a new and unsubstantiated explanation. The presiding judge reminds the LP counsel of their time limit, and they quickly conclude their address, reiterating the petitioner's case and requesting the announcement of the judgment date. The courtroom atmosphere remains charged as each side passionately presents their arguments, leaving the audience eagerly awaiting the court's final decision.